What's going on, everyone? During this interview, we had a slight technical mishap take place. So in about nine minutes and 40 seconds into this interview, you will hear the audio slightly change. We had to finish this interview on the telephone. Although I have cleaned it up a great deal, telephone is usually not a great way of doing a podcast, but we needed to get this all important interview out to you. So I just want to make you guys aware of that. So you think something happened and I hope you guys enjoy this interview. Thank you. He was one of the best running backs in college football. In 1988, while wearing jersey number 33, playing for the West Virginia Mountaineers, led by the legendary coach Don Nealon, he helped take them to an undefeated season. He has taken his experience from those days and parlayed that into what he currently does as a teacher, inspirational speaker, and CEO. Join me as I talk to two-time best-selling author, Eugene Napoleon, on this episode of True Crime and Authors. Welcome to True Crime and Authors Podcast, where we bring two passions together. The show that gives new meaning to the old adage, truth is stranger than fiction. Here's your host, David McClam. What's going on, everybody? This is your man, David McClam. Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Authors. So let's jump into it. Today, I am excited to have the person that we have. Very educated, very smart young man. Let me give you a little bit about the author we're going to talk to today. He was a running back for West Virginia Mountaineer team in 1988. That team did go undefeated in the regular season. It was led by Hall of Famers Major Harris and Coach Don Nealon. Uh, he also was a former professional football player for the Canadian Football League, which is an arena football league as well. He is the inspiration. He's an inspirational speaker. He is also the CEO of Fnap Vision Entertainment, LLC. He is a two-time best-selling author of the books Dream Real, which we're going to talk about today, and Reflections. And he's also one of the greatest uncles in the world. Why? Because he's mine. So I want to welcome to you guys today, Mr. Eugene Napoleon. Uncle Eugene, how you doing today, my friend? Listen, I'm blessed. And, and what you just said, man, uh, I'm highly favored, obviously. But thank you so much. It is a blessing and an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you, nephew. It is an honor to have you here. And let me point out, because I'll be remiss not to, that you're also an excellent husband, father, and grandfather now welcome to the grandfather days you know you finally joining me so welcome <laughs> thank you thank you yes 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 all the above definitely a blessing from the man upstairs for sure so obviously reading all those stats you're very busy you have been very busy um yeah. the book that i want to talk to you about today is the one that i've actually read i've started reading reflections uh which is inspirational quotes is a very good book the whole name of the book is Dream Real, a top sports agent's tips for teens series about going pro. Yes. What made you want to write Dream Real? What was the inspiration behind writing that book? The answer is going to surprise you. I actually started thinking about writing a book probably my freshman year in college, uh, which was at the University of Pittsburgh. And just going through and dealing with some of the adversities and some of the things during my freshman year. Losing my older sister, she died of an aneurysm of the brain uh, at 32. I started reflecting on some of the things that a Division I student athlete had to deal with on and off the field before dealing with personal issues like that, for instance. You know, I was actually really journaling some of this stuff. It struck me as odd. You don't get an opportunity to kind of reflect on things real time while you're actually dealing with it because. Being a student athlete, playing at a Division I high level like that, it's almost like, not to say all coaches feel this way, but it's about wins and losses, you know, the bottom line. No one's really caring about what you're going through. So when I realized that, I literally was, was writing notations even back then. You're talking about this was back in 1985. When I made the transition to transfer to WVU, I continued to write. and. 
through a course of many, many years and, and, and different ups and downs, obstacles, adversities, whatever, I wound up pinning Dream Real because it's literally the reality of what you go through just in life's journey. And then the reflection part of it was my mom, man, my mother taught me so many different things about how to deal with adversity and, and, and never give up and to be a driven individual. And you make decisions based on morals and character and values versus making decisions based on chasing money. All of those things was reflective of some of the things that I went through as a young college student athlete, as a professional athlete. And I decided to sit down and pin that in Dream Real. Also, at that time, you know, being a, a sports agent and representing other professional athletes and entertainers and things of that nature, it really made sense, I thought, to pin all of that in a book and just share it. You know, these are the things that you go through when you are, let's say, a professional athlete or entertainer, whatever that case, whatever that may be. These are some of the pitfalls that I think you need to look out for because here's I'm sharing with you, giving you the insight of what I went through, you know, during the course of my journey. So that's pretty much what made me write Dream Real. Now, we know that you, or at least I know, that you were a sports agent at one point. At one point, you were the agent for Cheryl Swoop. So, you know, we know you know what you're talking about. The thing that gets me about this one, before I get into that, because I do want to talk to you about, uh, in your book, Chapter 7, you talk about the 10 biggest mistakes that you feel that professional athletes make. Um, but before then, you talked a lot about your mom. And that your mom told you, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it. Like me, we was raised very poor in the projects on welfare. We always had dreams, right? We, this, right? this show for me is a dream. You know, people say we can't do these things. Your mom was a very inspirational part of your life. Is that your driving force to get you through everything you got through? Absolutely. And part of this, part of Dream Real really was a tribute to my mother. You know, uh, the old adage that a woman can't raise a man, you know, you hear these different things through the societal norms of you can't get this type of advice from a woman. My mother single handedly taught me everything I needed to know to get to the point of where I am currently in my life. I thank her to the grave she went for everything she taught me, because everything she said, let me tell you something, I went through some of those trials and tribulations. And I had a lot of advice that she kind of poured into me to go back to. Writing this book was one of them. You know, honestly, writing the book was one of them because she shared some information and some things with me, man, that to this day, I give of myself because of what my mother gave me. And I, I was blessed to have her. I found this kind of funny, but you are a proud West Virginia mountaineer. We talked a little bit about yes. your career in the beginning. One of the baddest boys out there to do the, to do as far as I'm concerned, running back number 33, doing his thing. But in the book, you say that you actually wanted to go to the University of Pittsburgh because you wanted to follow in Tony, in Tony Dorsett's footsteps. What happened to that? Absolutely. So I think I remember this as if it was yesterday. So, and I wish I would have paid better attention in, in, in learning how to cook because I can't cook a lick. And my wife could attest to that. And so can my son. But <laughs> I digress. So I was seven years old and my mother was in the kitchen cooking. And I remember watching Pittsburgh play Notre Dame, national televised game. Tony Dorsett is ripping Notre Dame apart. I think he wound up having over 300 yards that day, a few touchdowns. And I remember running in the kitchen and screaming, Ma, Ma, I know exactly what I want to do. I know exactly what college I want to go to. And again, I'm seven. So she comes out the kitchen, she turns the stuff off in the kitchen, she comes out, she says, what are you screaming about? And I, I, I had a chance to tell her, I watched this guy, his name is Tony Dorsett, he wears number 33, he plays for the University of Pittsburgh, he's a running back, that's exactly where I want to go to school, I want to be just like him. He was my sports hero, right? My mother always had the ability to sit you down, and when you say something, her thing was always, it's not about what you say. How do we get to accomplish and what's the blueprint to getting to what you want to accomplish and how are we going to do that? Your mouth verbally says it, but you got to put action behind it. She was always big on that. She sat down at that little dinette set and we started formulating at seven, the blueprint, being the best student that you can be, being the best person that you can be, 
making the right decisions, hang, you know, working hard, being diligent, all these things. I was seven years old, but that started my hunger and my drive in wanting to achieve that. So even to the point of picking a high school, I decided whatever high school in my immediate area didn't even have to be in my area, who had a connection to Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, that's the high school I was going to go to. And that's what led me to St. Joseph's because the legendary Frank Gargiulo, who is still like a, a surrogate father to me to this day, what a great man. His son, Frank Jr., was actually the fullback at University of Pittsburgh at the time. And it just so happened when my mom and I took the visit to go visit St. Joseph's, Frank happened to have been in his father's office, who was not only our head coach, but he was also the building's principal at the time. And he had this big, I'll never forget it, this huge yellow jacket on with the, with, with the big P-I-T-T in blue going across the back. Lost my mind. As soon as I saw that, I said, this is where I need to go. I need to come here. Now, that was one end of it. Your grandmother's other, uh, her end of it was, as soon as she saw that there was a chapel built into the school, she was good with that. When she saw that there was a chapel built into the school, <laughs> she said, this is where he's going. <laughs> <laughs> Can't make this up. True story. Um. A lot of my friends didn't understand why I would make the, the choice to attend St. Joseph's only because at the time, two seasons prior to that, they were 0-9. But the one thing Frank Gargiulo said to me, which I will never forget, he said, listen, I wouldn't care if you ran for 5,000 yards and scored 100 touchdowns. You're going to be a human being far longer than you're going to be a football player. It's the, the best and the most important aspect of this is being the best person that you can be. That's what I'm interested in. When, you know, when my mother heard that and when I heard that, I was mature enough even back then to understand that this man, it, it's more than just about football for him. It's truly about building and helping to nurture the best version of yourself. Th that alone, uh, you know, helped me to make that decision to want to go to St. Joseph's. Wow. So, yeah, because I, I do know you went there and you came and did some good things. We can get back to that in a minute. I do want to tap into your 10 biggest mistakes made by professional athletes because a lot of these, actually all of them, are still very relevant today. So let me go through them just for the audience here. Uh, they forget who they really are and where they come from. They start treating people differently. The respect level seems to change. They change the people they hang around or around them and their social circle gets too big. They become above the laws and rules. They become addicted to the special treatment. The expectation with women changes. They start spending money before they even have it. They didn't get an education. They pick the wrong agent or the wrong people to look after their best interests. And they get caught up in the unreal world that comes with that came with professional lifestyle. I definitely want to tap more into number six, because mm -hmm. with everything that's going on in the world today, what you wrote about that was very interesting. And the number six one is the expectation with women changes. And you wrote many players won't enter a club without two or three women as part of their entourage. This becomes the mindset of a professional athlete. The players know that many women are looking for money and a good time. So they use that to their advantage. When you are in high school, your family designates a certain area to display your trophies. When you make it to the show, the trophies are the women. When players go out to the elite clubs and restaurants, there is no more res uh, respectable uh, currency than a gorgeous woman. During my life, I have known plenty of guys who were real players when it came to women. The one commodity is their insatiable appetite. Whether they were married or not didn't matter. Life is just a big game to them, and they want to win every day. I find that very interesting with all the things going on now with all the sexual harassment and things of that nature. Do you still feel like this is what's happening as far as women and why, uh, why are women devalued to that degree when it comes to professional athlete? Absolutely. I think it's even worse now because right now from a societal, there is no societal norms anymore. Those things have been unfortunately washed away, broken down. And now you have it. It's even worse because I'm writing from a perspective back then in 2006, 2007, 2008, 
you look at it now in 2022, now the, the, the kind of money that these players are making now dwarfs what the salaries were, were back then. So now you even have more access to different things. Unfortunately, I think the women, for some odd reason, they devalue themselves because they seem to be devalued from a societal standpoint. Now, you couple that with a young lady who has daddy issues or has low self-esteem issues. And you're talking about there's a three prong problem there. You're dealing with a three headed monster there because now you're looking at what you think is success with a guy that has a lot of money wearing a lot of jewelry, lives in a big mansion, driving fancy cars. And guess what? He is suffering from the same things that the females are suffering from because he thinks that the trappings of success means I got to go and live this extravagant lifestyle to make myself feel good about who I am internally. Misery loves company. So nine times out of 10, it's that engine that drives both these individuals to connect with each other. And usually it's not a good thing because it's so superficial on the surface. There's not even a core relationship there. It's so superficial on the surface that usually there's a lot of mistakes made in that because that particular player will continue to go through women like socks. The women continue to be accessible to him because they have poor self-esteem and like I said, daddy issues and they don't feel good about themselves. It's not until the woman wakes up to realize I'm not a commodity. I'm worth more than just you sleeping with me and tossing me to the side. And now the next day it's some other woman. And now you're then going to go chase because if if you haven't woken up from that, you're going to continue to make the same mistakes because she's chasing other players that are doing the same exact thing. It's not until the woman wakes up to say, I'm worth more than that. And I'm not going to allow myself to get treated this way. So now on the other side of that coin, uh, what do you think about the women that set out just to entrap professional athletes? Because I do think it works both ways where there's actually women that makes careers out of just trying to date somebody with status so that they can get rich or paid or whatever. Uh, even to the point of where I've seen them before uh, get pregnant on purpose so that that person is there. What's your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Unfortunate. You know, I, I remember during my freshman year, as a matter of fact, it even went back during my senior year in high school, you know, and I was blessed and fortunate to be one of the top running backs in the entire nation. So make it seven All-American teams could have went in any, to any school I wanted to. So obviously when you get your official visits, you go on these visits and I had, you know, I had host and hostesses. The hostesses obviously were females. Even back then, you're talking about 17, 18 years of age. I started to see the the, the, the different ways that I was being treated on my official visits versus let's say a kid who made just let's say, you know, there's no, uh, you know, shrug against make it all county or all, st- or, or, or all conference or all state because those things are great accomplishments, but I saw the difference in levels of even being an all American versus a kid who just made all state. Right. I had a hostess. Maybe they didn't. So on my visits, I started to even see at 17, 18, like, wow, this is different. They're using these females to get these players to, to, to come to their universities. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I started seeing it then. So when I got to college my freshman year, I remember having a female tell me that her mother basically groomed her to say, when you go to college and you meet one of these, you know, uh, standout athletes, I don't care if it's football or basketball, you know, you make sure that you 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 hook into one of those guys because those guys are going to make it big and you'll be right there on his arm. And I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was my freshman year in college. So you're 100 percent right. The notion that there may be some parents out there that's going to push their daughters that way is very true. You know, I've experienced that myself. I've seen that. Again, I've heard it. And for the most part, you don't want to believe that it's that shallow or, 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 or it's that conniving of a plan, that blueprint. But it is. And I really do feel sorry for the players that don't 
they don't get it. You know what I mean? Until you get trapped or whatever the case may be, they don't get it because yeah, they <laughs> they are being targeted. Some of them, some of them know it, and some of them don't know. It. This is why the the top players they will have females sign waivers before you know they they you know they deal with them or they date them or whatever the case. They will have them if I'm gonna even if they're gonna have a one night stance with them, they'll have them sign something. To let anybody know this this was enforced, this was what it is, and you do have people who do that. So <laughs> you're right. It does happen the other way as well. Okay, so this this comes to a question. So you graduated from St. Joseph High School. While you were there, you made seven high school All-American teams. You was ranked the 13th best running back in the country, number three on the East Coast by Tom Lemming, which, you know, at that time, he was viewed as the number one high school football recruiting analyst in the country. Of course, then you went to West Virginia. You played there on an undefeated team. Then you end up at the Canadian Football League, where in 1992, you were you played for the Orlando Predators and the Tampa Bay Storm. You caught five passes for 30 yards, no receiving touchdown yards. Question there is, after all of that, all of this knowledge you put in this book, why did you never go pro in the NFL? And now, wow, great segue. So... I'm going to go back real quick. My senior year in high school, I um, wound up getting hurt after the fourth game. Was averaging over 200 yards a game, averaging three, four touchdowns a game, going in, into the third, the fourth game. I wound up stretching, uh, uh, almost tearing. I would have been better off from what the doctor told me if I would have tore my ligaments, but I stretched every ligament in my right ankle out of place. So I wound up missing... Uh, I want to say really the majority of my senior year in high school, that injury, I wound up having a similar injury plus a hairline fracture in my ankle, um, going into my senior year, uh, in college. Crazy enough, Mel Kuyper had me ranked, I want to say, uh, third, fourth, maybe a mid round draft pick going into my senior season. Then I get hurt in camp, hobbled through an injury plague senior year at West Virginia, wound up having 20 of the 28 teams come to the campus to work me out. 20 had me on the draft board as a mid to late round draft pick. Eight had me listed as a free agent. For some odd reason, I don't get drafted, right? And I don't even get a chance to go to camp. Then (laughs) what winds up happening is, you, as you get older, you start running into different scouts and you start running into different player personnel directors, you know, at, at, at these NFL levels. And the interesting thing is you start to find out things that you didn't know. So for, for, for one, it was said that I was injury prone. It was said that uh, I'm a great back when healthy, but I won't do what it takes to win. Now, all of that comes from you get hurt, you're playing at the, these different levels. Nowadays, you know, guys get, you know, they'll take a needle, they'll get shot up to to help heal their injuries or whatever the case may be. Well, my whole career, I never got shot up. I never took, you know, a needle to, 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 to ease the pain or whatever the case may be. So I don't know. I think that maybe when, when, when it was said that I wouldn't do what it takes to win, maybe they was talking about that. I'm not sure. I do know this. It was quite odd to work out for 28 at the time. It was only 28 teams in the league and and 20 have me on their draft board. Eight has me as a free agent and I don't get a look at all. Although let me not say that God bless him to the grave. He went, I did. And I was just talking about the late great Jim Garrett. What a great man. Jim Garrett actually worked me out for the Cowboys. The year that Emmett Smith set out, uh, I want to say those first three games, and they wound up signing Lincoln Coleman, who was a journeyman at the time, you know, in the NFL. And I'll never forget it. You know, Jim always had he was always prone to young people from New Jersey because he was from Red Bank, New Jersey. Great man. Great man. We we're just talking about him the other day, actually. So when you go through that process, you start to say, well, I still want to have a shot to play professionally. And lucky for me, you know, playing in the Arena Football League and then playing in 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 the CFL and the Canadian Football League, those were two opportunities to play professionally and and play a uh, get paid for playing a a kid's game that you love. But it always made me think about the next level and some of the reasons why I speak openly to young people now about 
you're not the one making the decisions when it comes to your career and getting a shot at the next level. And unfortunately, if you have any kind of issues with your coaching staff, um, the medical staff, these things play out differently than what you think they're going to play out by the time it's time for you to go to the next level, because all it takes is, you know, your head coach, position coach, whatever the case may be, offensive, defensive coordinator, whoever it is, if they have a strong relationship with these scouts and these front office, you know, people or GMs at the next level, let me tell you something. You you would not believe how difficult it is to get into somebody's camp, even or to get drafted, because you hear it all the time. Currently, draft stock will drop because of so and so's off the field antics, or this one he had a problem with. With this. now, don't get me wrong, being a commodity in winning football games or basketball games, whatever the case may be, is very prevalent. Is very true. So yes, the higher your stock is, of course you know, you're going to get an opportunity because you, you help to feed the bottom line. But if you are injured and you have these whatever back and forth with a coach and they don't like you, it's no different than you and I talking right now on this interview and we own teams and you and I are close and one player that you like that I may not like, and we're about to draft and, you have a draft pick before I do. I decide to pick up the phone and call you and say, Hey, I don't like that kid. Well, why? A, B, and C reasons. Really? You may or may not draft that young man based on my recommendation. <laughs> it's very prevalent. So that kind of brings you to this question. So my cousin, your son, Brandon, former West Virginia university cornerback. Now very good coach over at sacred heart. Did you write this book for him in sort of ways to let him know what the pitfalls will be? Because if you if you look at his career parallel, it's almost parallel to yours with the exception of the position. Uh, He's outstanding. He's excellent. He's good. I just watched the interview that you just did with him um, on your show, Relatively Sports. And the way that he was just articulating and spitting out football knowledge was like he's been doing this for 40 years. So was this book kind of like a a warning to him that you kind of feel that he would probably go in that direction growing up? Absolutely. Um, In that book, there's a piece, the last conversation with the bishop, and it was my brother, Freddie, a week before he passed. We sat down and we spoke, and I think I was in chapter three of Dream Real at that point. And he said to me, listen, you have to finish this book because... And at the time, Brandon was very young. He said, Brandon needs to know why you're so driven. He needs to know why you work so hard. He needs to know why you're so passionate about the things that you're passionate about. To this day, I still don't smoke. I still don't drink. I never got into partying. So he was right. He was right. When he passed, I shut everything down for a few months to finish this, to finish Dream Real because at first off, I told him that I would. I said, you know what? You're right. But of course, there were pieces in that book that I thought about as it related to Brandon. And I said, you know what? When he gets older, he needs to understand this stuff because it's it's true. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, people don't like to talk what's true. They don't want to walk on their own truth. So going through it myself, I'm talking from a perspective of sitting in the driver's seat because I went through it. Now, had I not gone through some of those experiences, it would be very difficult for me to speak on it. So even from the dream real perspective, when you read that book, I'm talking about my experiences. I'm not throwing a, a, a rock at anybody else. I'm not throwing stones at anybody else. That book is specifically written from my personal experiences and encounters. And I definitely wanted him to have somewhat of a lesson plan, to have a clear understanding of what this is. If you are an athlete of that caliber, these are the things that could potentially happen. And here are some of the pitfalls. Here at True Crime and Authors, I read a lot of books. Every author that you've heard me interview and everyone that you will hear me interview, I've either read one of their books or I'm in the process of reading one. So how do I keep up with all of the books that I read Well, that is where the show's sponsor, Catch Creations 614, comes into play. Catch Creations makes digital handmade planners and journals 
and for those who want something on paper, printables as well. She can make anything from My Little Pony to Black Panther, anything that you can creatively think of, Cats Creation 614 can get it done. With excellent customer service and excellent communication, the owner, Kristen, will make sure that your journal comes out right and perfect the first time. And for those who are listeners of this show, you will get a special 10% discount when you use the code TRUECRIME10. Catch Creations, best handmade planners, journals, and printables in the business. Check it out now. So even though this book was written a while ago, the one thing I like about doing these kind of interviews, I think it's like 2006 or so, is when you read material and it is still very relevant to today, where I can take this book and put it in the kid's hand and said, if you want, really want to go pro and know what it's like, read this book. I feel the same way about Janet Jackson's Rhythm Nation album, right? It's all 30 some years ago and everything going on in the world today is just as it was said 30 years later. What is it that you would want somebody? Because when I run into young people who want to go into sports or think about it, I always say, you need to go read this book. Now, the thing is, they automatically look at me when they go look it up and go, are you telling me this because this cat looks like you? So it's always been said that me and you look alike. <laughs> um, and I do admit, yes, he's my uncle. Absolutely. But if you read what he's writing, I'm not telling you to read the book because he's my uncle. I'm telling you to read it because he's been here. He's done it. He refused to cheat to win. And when I say that to some of these young kids, they're like, what do you mean by cheating to win? And I tell them the story that you just told, because, you know, me and you've had this conversation before. I just wanted to ask you on air so you can tell people exactly that cheat to win really does exist. And it keeps you from a lot of opportunities going on because of that. You won't do whatever it takes to win, which I really commend you for that. What is it that you would want young people today, 2022, to take away from Dream Real? I think just be real. Like, in other words, be authentically you and don't let any one person, group of people, any, you know, hidden opportunity that somebody else has an agenda for, don't let that change or sway who you really are. And what I mean by that is, and, and, and this is every industry, not just sports. It's the music entertainment industry, which I'm part of for the last 27 years as well. It's all of these things. Young people don't understand they truly do have the power because individuals see them as a commodity. And everybody knows a commodity is something that can be used that's going to turn a coin, that's going to turn financial gain for someone else. You are a commodity. The, the saddest thing that young people don't get, if you just sit back and be patient enough, to view things or opportunities exactly for what they are, instead of chasing it, you get a chance to make better decisions. In other words, when I talk to young student athletes, the reason why I tell them it's student athlete for a reason, learn your craft, go to school, be as serious as you can possibly be and as diligent as you are in the weight room or in the field, be that in the classroom. Because what you don't understand is Good habits are good habits, and they they transfer into everything else. If you study hard, you 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 research, you're a good student, you're going to be just as meticulous on the football field, on the basketball court, on the baseball diamond, because those behaviors become second nature to you. You can't have one without the other. So I would want them to take away from Dream Real. Be who you are authentically and don't let someone sway you based on their agenda. Right. That's all very. Yes, that's that's what I take away from the book. Um, I'm not an athlete, but, you know, I've inspired to do things for just for people to know. We come from a very talented family. Um, I'm a musician. My first musician has been since four. We got a number of musicians in the family. We come from a long line of ministers and bishops. Um, and the work ethic that our family has is just outrageous. Uh, we're always driven to keep doing things to inspire people. And that's why I do this show is to bring people like yourself on that are authors, but also have uh, wisdom of life to be able to share it with us. And speaking of that, so after you got through a dream real Barnes and Noble's number one bestseller, still pulling down five star ratings all these years later, 
you decided to jump in and write Reflections, a book of inspiring quotes and thoughts to help build confidence and self-esteem. Why did you decide to write Reflections? And great question. So I'm sitting home one day and I'm watching, actually, I'm watching a preseason game in the NFL. And for some odd reason, it, a commercial came on and it was one of the commercials dealing with a uh, young person not wanting to read. And I think his mom actually uh, took him to a program that would help foster you know, inspiration for him to read. And I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, <laughs> that, you know, that that connected with me because, as everybody knows, I'm also a special education teacher. This September, God willing, when I step into my building, it'll be my 25th year as an educator. And that's something that's always been a problem, even with my students. You know, young people don't like to read. So it clicked in my head. You know what? If you give them something that's short, that's, you know, somewhat easy to get through. Success is all about the completion of a task. It's very true. And them being able to, to, to read something that makes them feel good about themselves, a it, it does build, you know, positive self-esteem because, wow, I read a book. You feel good about that, especially if it's something that's knowledgeable that can help them make better decisions. So I said, you know what? Everybody likes quotes because they're short, they're deliberate, they're to the point, they're very detailed. I'm going to write a motivational quotes book. And that's really what what stirred it up. So I decided to to take, you know, five topics, 10 motivational quotes per topic. And that's what I decided to do. And and I'm so glad I did, because that's what it's used for in the classrooms. Teachers, especially language arts teachers, they use it as what you call a do now in the morning. They'll take a quote, one or two quotes from 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 reflections, and they'll literally have their, their students write. What does this quote mean to you? I did uh, towards the end of the school year this past year, I went to a middle school in Linden, New Jersey, and uh, I took just five uh, of these quotes, you know, sporadically throughout the book and read it to the to the to the uh, student body. And I told them, when you go home, you know, the school ordered uh, 100 and some odd copies for this particular grade level so they can go home in the summer and, and, and go back and forth with their parents. I said, you know what you do? Have your parents take a quote. You take a quote. You write down, you know, a short little paragraph as to what that meant to you and have your parents write down one that they picked and you switch. That way you're engaging with each other, you know, with this particular book, with the quotes. Awesome. The feedback was incredible. So that was really my motivation as to why I wrote Reflections. I felt like that for those who don't like to read something short that they can get through, feel success with, and also use some of these short quotes to help them make better decisions in their life. You know, that's what really motivated motivated me to write it. Well, let me tell you, it is a short book. It's 59 pages long, but reflections grip you when you open it. The first two quotes that you give when you open the book grabbed me, which the first one was allow the love in your heart to speak louder than your words. And then the second one was your eyes will always speak the truth when it comes to matters of the heart. Those two, especially that one is because that's why when my career started on YouTube, that's why I decided that I wanted to be on video. It's easy to deceive people if you can't see them. Um, But it's very hard to because your eyes tell the story of how you truly feel about whatever it is you are doing or talking about. And that's why I chose that route. And then when people start to trust me, I can come to radio or podcasting like this and they know, hey, this cat's really telling the truth of what he's, who he's talking about because we actually seen him before. Uh, very, it's a very good book. It helps me inspirationally. You know, I read a couple of quotes every day. It's easy. It's short. I have it on my Kindle because I carry my Kindle with me everywhere because I'm always reading. So wow. Reflections lives in my Kindle. And every morning before I get up and leave or even before I walk into work, you know, I say, well, what what quote? does uncle Eugene have for me today? Um, and it's always been good quotes. And and sometimes these quotes and reflections come in at a time where I'm having a bad time. Right. And so the inspiration behind what you wrote lifts me up for the day and helps me to see that I can, I can get through that. What do you want everybody to take away from reflections? Yeah, it, I couldn't have said it better than what you just said, and, and and thank you for the kind words. 
I'll, I'll say this. There's a parent whose son is on, uh, is on the spectrum. She got the book for him and he was able to go, she was able to go through it page by page, quote by quote. And when she shared with me what he got from it, it almost brought me to tears because that was the very same purpose why I wrote it in the first place. And what she said to me in a nutshell was parents don't know what it's like to watch your child struggle with some of the things that most people take for granted. So to see him sit down and get so excited about reading where he never wanted to read too many things before because it was always a struggle, but there was something about the cover of your book that caught his attention. There was something about the fact that it was short. And when he did read something and he was asking, what does this mean? And when I explained it to him, the quote connected to his understanding. It all made sense to him and to see his eyes light up because it made sense. That's a very direct purpose. So what I would want anyone to get from this, you can't tell people how to disseminate information or, or how to you know, comprehend information. But what you can do, if you can give someone an opportunity to read something that inherently, it, 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 it bonds to them, it connects them to, to whatever life experience that they're going through, now you did something. What I want people to get from Reflections is just this. There, there, there's something in there from one of those 50 quotes that I know will connect with you because we all go through, like I said, ups and downs and trials and tribulations. I would hope that reflections is just that it gives you the opportunity to reflect on something that you want to change. And one of those quotes is going to help you to do that. If that's what that book does, I've met my purpose. And of course, reflections that gave you the second best selling book. So both of your books went bestseller. And I swear, I tell people this, and they're like, it's just because he's your uncle. No, I swear, everything you do uh, turns to gold. So that leads us into now what you're doing now, and you have done. So 27 years, you've been in the music industry. Uh, you're over the career of your wife, my aunt, Naya. Yep. She's a gold-selling, double-platinum, award-winning artist. Also, you know, Grammy thought of. Yes. Which I'm sure eventually one day I'm going to be watching the TV and you're going to call me and say, your aunt's getting a Grammy, make sure you tune in. Even the pandemic didn't slow you guys down. We Are Strong got released in 2020. Uh, she just came back this year with On The Daily, every song hitting. How is that? How is it to be over the career, not only of a successful artist, but she's also your wife? Uh, how do you guys run that? Mm. Well, let me... Another accomplishment now, I have to say, three times Platinum Award winning recording artist because on the daily, uh, three weeks ago, um, it's now considered a Platinum Award winning single. So what, <laughs> what a blessing. So like you said, We Are Strong in 2020, Platinum Award uh, chill out my baby in 2021 platinum award <laughs> and now 2022 with the release of on the daily platinum award. So <laughs> Jesus, um, uh, and you go back where her career really started back in, we released her first album embrace, which sold 500,000 copies. So that went gold. I'm going to tell you something. I, I thank God for it, nephew, because Every day she gets a chance to get up and do exactly what she wants to do. And my definition of success is exactly that freedom, being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. To me, that's my definition of what success is. OK, I can't speak for anybody else, but that's my personal definition of success to see her coach. Her two loves is what she lives uh, she's an All-American basketball player in college, Hall of Famer, got inducted in her college Hall of, Hall of Fame some years ago. She's been coaching collegiate basketball for the last 20 plus years successfully to flip that into her music career, which she's been doing now for 27 years to have 17 number one independent hit singles 
a gold selling album, three platinum awards, double Grammy considered recording artist. That's insane. It's insane. But for me, uh, I am so privileged and honored and blessed and so thankful to God that we get to live out the things that we dream about and we're not afraid to go after them. Whether you don't be afraid to, to fail, that's always been our adage. Just go after the things that you know God gave you the ability to do. And sooner or later, if you do it again authentically, you're gonna your talent is gonna reach people that it's supposed to reach. So to see her do that, I'm over the moon with it. I really am. Um, I'm very happy that she's happy in her space. So what was it like in the house when back in June 28th of 2020, this was written? Multiple award-winning R&B artist Naya, who is also the wife of former WVU running back Eugene Napoleon, has been named as Artist of the Month by MTV USA. <laughs> when I got that phone call, it, it literally um, humbling, uh, gratitude, blessed, feeling that, you know, the masses get it. And here's the thing, you know, the masses getting it is one thing, but, but, but staying true to yourself is something totally different. So what I mean by that is, you know, my wife has never changed who she is as an artist. She just grew into it. So she writes her own songs. We put out music based on literally how she's feeling about certain things and, and, and what a great creative process. So to see that award come and, and I was like, wow, OK, blew my mind because the connection was usually when you talk about independent releases and we, we've owned uh, we've owned our company now for 27 years and it's it's an indie. Of course, we've had opportunities to go to majors and but she gets a chance to do it her way. We get a chance to release the kind of music that we want to release that we think are impactful, thoughtful, meaningful. Those things are very important to us. And again, it's authentic. So a lot of times when you're with a major, they're going to control what that what that looks like, sounds like and all of that just because of the money. So to see her connect with such a major platform like, you know, uh, MTV USA, it, it, it tells you that. Everything that you guys have been doing is, is culminating is, is culminating in such a major way that it's working. People are now really on the quote unquote mainstream level. They're paying attention. So what a day that was. Yeah, it, it was incredible. And just let everybody know, We Are Strong was written um, after, you know, she saw the murder of Armand Arbery um, and she was inspired by him to write this song. So that leads me to what you are currently doing. So we know you have Napoleon's Corner on the Mountaineer Maven uh, channel. Uh, now you have Relatively Sports featuring Eugene Napoleon, which is Sports Illustrated. I know that show just started. Brandon was your first guest. I did catch that you're going to have uh, Aunt Naya on uh, to talk about her basketball days and coaching on your next episode. Are we going to are we looking forward to any more books from Eugene Napoleon? Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting that you say that. I normally like to let things, I, I call it this, I term it, I like to let things breathe for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to let uh, Reflections dream for a little bit. I mean, live and, and breathe for a little bit more, God willing. But absolutely, absolutely, I'm going to pin. Matter of fact, I'm thinking about pinning a book about, you know, my years as an executive to current date in the music entertainment industry because, you know, I used to manage the R&B group Total, who was signed to Bad Boy. You know, uh, I currently manage, obviously, you know, Naya. I currently manage, manage you know, a Grammy-nominated uh, producer, Kenny Black, The Music Machine. And this is a, a, a true blessing. I actually manage my cousin, who is one half of the legendary group PM Dawn, Jared Cordes a tremendous writer and producer in his own right. So he's produced the last two hit singles for Naya, which is Chillin' With My Baby and now currently on the daily. So my next piece is probably, God willing, maybe pinning a book about my experiences in the music entertainment industry over the last 27 years. 
I think that would be a good book to write because of the fact that getting what I got and what everybody else who's reading got out of Dream Real, I know that if I read a book that you write about that, you're going to come and give us the truth. Absolutely. Um, I've read a lot of other books about the uh, the industry. I've read a lot of other books about um, the sporting industry. I've actually listened to several podcasts and it always seemed like they wanted to hold something back or there was an excuse that was being made for why things were done. So it's very rare that we get the real deal from somebody who's willing to tell the truth, no matter what the cost is. And that is, that's, that's definitely you. I appreciate you. What is it in closing, anything that you'd like to say to your fans out there, anybody that's listening from Western Virginia, what would you like to say to them? Listen, uh, very proud. And, and I say that with a badge of honor, very proud to have attended graduated and played for West Virginia University. It means a lot to be a Mountaineer. That's one for all of the young student athletes out there and, and students regular that doesn't, that don't even play sports. Please understand, be focused on the things that you want to accomplish because you can, and don't allow anybody to tell you what you can't do. It's not their life. It's not their 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 lane. It's not their journey. Each of us, we all have an ind individual journey. Make sure that you do everything that you possibly can to be the best version of yourself each and every day. When you wake up and you put both of your feet on the ground, firmly planted, give God thanks. Be blessed. Know that you're blessed because that each day it gives us a chance to hit the reset button, to try to mend and or fix the mistakes that we we uh, had or made the day prior from that. Please understand that. To my family, nephew, I am blessed, humbled, and so honored and appreciative to be on your platform. This is amazing. I wish you nothing but success. Uh, to my beautiful wife, you already know, uh, Tracy Napoleon, AKA Naya, Love you to the moon and back. Brandon, he knows that. He, uh, that's that's how I'll say it, actually. I love you to the moon and back. You know, my, my grandbaby Amari, mwah, that's my diaper. That's, what, <laughs> that's my guy. You know, my daughter in love, Nicole. All of my family, uh, all of my nieces and nephews, all of my family. We have a big family. I love each and every one of you. And I'm hoping and praying that at one certain point, we all get an opportunity to do exactly what we want to do and live the purpose that God has put us, each and every one of us on this earth to live. That's my prayer. Well, let me tell you, I thoroughly thank you for coming on the show. You've always been the real, the one uncle in my life that's always been grounded, kept things down. Even when I was young, my mom, rest her soul, went to her grave telling the story of how Uncle Bubby saved me from a beating once because you ran me <laughs> out of the house and down the block so she couldn't get to me. <laughs> um, so a lot of my life too, seeing the success that you've had, um, has pushed me to believe that I can do whatever I want to do. This is my second podcast and I'm hoping it takes off. And with having guests like you on the show, I'm sure that it will. Um, you are the embodiment of why I started this show, not only to get people close to authors and books they have not read or don't know about, but also to dig a little bit into the author's life, you know, let, let them know what they went through so that they can see that they too can do whatever it is that they want to do. So again, I thank you for coming on the show and the show is better for you being here today. Wow. Thank you, nephew. I'm humbled. Thank you. All right, guys. So I hope you guys enjoyed that interview with Eugene Napoleon. Make sure you go out and grab his books, Dream Real and Reflections. Dream Real, you can pick up for $13.95 right now over on Amazon. And Reflections is on sale for 64% off, so $3.99. You don't go to Amazon, any place books are sold. Also, make sure you follow us on all of the social media that you will hear at the end of this, including Facebook. And we thank you for tuning in to this episode. Once again, go out there, Dream Real, Reflections, Eugene Napoleon. You can find all of his information and links in the show note as well as the website. All right, guys. So always remember, this is the podcast that brings two passions together. We'll catch you in the next one.
Thank you for listening to True Crime and Authors. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. Join us on social media, on Facebook at True Crime and Authors, on Twitter at Authors True, on YouTube and TikTok at True Crime and Authors, and email at truecrimeandauthors at gmail.com. Cover art and logo designed by Dazzling underscore Ray from Fiverr. Sound mixing and editing by David McClam. Intro script by Sophie Wilde from Fiverr. And I'm the voice guy, your imaging guy from Fiverr. See you next time on True Crime and Authors.